Hello, and welcome to today's webcast on how to maximize efficiency in your senior living community. I'm Lois Bauer, Senior Editor of McKnight Senior Living, and I'll be your moderator today. Every day, you and your colleagues face decisions about how to address increasing resident expectations and how to be good stewards of organizational resources, among other challenges and opportunities. In the presentation today, Mark Shadil, <laughs> Shadil of Lutheran Senior Services and Rachel Karakni of Dude Solutions will explain how embracing technology and gathering data enable efficiency in key aspects of senior living operations, including asset management, staffing, budgeting, utilities planning, and contractor relationships. I'll tell you more about Mark and Rachel in a few moments, but first we have some housekeeping matters to take care of. First, I'd like you to know that today's slides are available for download. To download them, please see the red Resources tab on the upper right part of your screen. And if you think you're experiencing audio difficulty with this broadcast, please first check on the volume control on your computer. We found that this is the most common cause of hearing issues with presentations like this one. The sound should come through your computer speakers, and if the volume control doesn't appear to be the issue, then please click the red Test Your Connection button under the slides, if necessary. Click the Chat Live button on the Test Your Connection page to receive additional assistance if you need it. Please also keep only one browser window open on your computer to prevent echo. Also, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of today's presentation. If you have any questions about the information presented, <clears throat> please feel free to send them directly to us at any time during this hour by entering them into the Ask a Question box below the slides and clicking on the red Submit button. Today's program is made possible by support from Dude Solutions, provider of the Works Hub. To learn more about the company, please visit dudesolutions.com. Finally, this session will be archived and available on demand shortly after this live broadcast. You can access this webcast again at no cost, and others can experience it for the first time again at no cost by simply going to the registration page to enter this studio. The web address is mcknightsseniorliving.com slash July 25 webinar. You also can use the link you received via email or can visit our website mcknightsseniorliving.com and click on events in the navigation bar at the top of the page and then on webcasts in the drop down menu. Now I'd like to tell you more about today's featured speakers. Mark Shadow is Vice President of Construction and Capital Projects, and he supports the 18 Lutheran Senior Service Communities with Special Facilities Projects. He has worked at LSS since 1994 in various roles, including facility management, information technology oversight, and management of construction projects. During his time with the organization, Mark has overseen more than $400 million in construction projects and has developed in-house standards for construction and facility support for use in LLS, LSS communities. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Missouri and a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Rachel Karakni is a Senior Implementation Specialist at Dude Solutions and works every day to help senior living clients of all sizes and care offerings use the Works Hub. She has been with Dude Solutions for four years and currently is the team lead for senior living implementation. During their presentation, you will learn about major shifts happening in the senior living industry, five key operational areas to focus on and how to increase efficiency in each of them, and how Lutheran Senior Services has used technology to become more efficient. So without further ado, let me turn things over to Mark and Rachel so they can begin their presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lois, for the introductions. So hopping in to give you a little bit of, about, of an idea of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so thank you for the, the introductions. Uh, we're going to start things off by talking a little bit about the state of the senior living industry. We've got some key trends uh, that we want to take a couple of minutes to discuss before we hop into five operational areas uh, that we think are important to focus on. And then we're going to end things with a couple of key takeaways uh, that Mark is going to share 
uh, just some learnings uh, of his time with LSS. So we do want to go ahead and launch a poll here before we dive into the material. Uh, so the, the poll question that we'd like you to answer is, which area of your operations do you want to improve most? So I know you probably wish you could uh, pick all four of these today, um, but please limit your selection to just one. Uh, so we want to see the results here. So which areas do you want to improve most between tracking assets and capital planning, staff productivity and time management, reducing energy and utility costs, or knowing when to use internal staff versus contractors? So those are some of the, the key areas that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and the, the story that Mark and I are, are hoping to tell is that after discussing some of the trends that are at the, the forefront of our industry that are affecting your day-to-day -day operations, is we want to help you identify some areas where you can improve efficiencies uh, so that you can overcome some of these challenges. Rachel, why didn't you have one that said all the above? <laughs> I think everyone would choose that as an option, wouldn't they? Yeah, as for our organization, it would probably be that staff productivity and time management key to us right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. All of those are are big ones that we hear about on the daily. So I think we'll leave that poll up for just a little bit longer. Um, and we're going to be presenting the results to you as well so that you can see where everyone stands. So kind of jumping ahead into uh, some of the, the trends that we're going to get started off with here while that poll is still up uh, is, you know, talking a couple of minutes about the, the middle market um, and the, the silver tsunami that is approaching. Uh, so I know we could have a, a whole webinar around that topic, um, but that, that trend is going to kind of then move us into talking a little bit about resident needs uh, and staff demand. All right. So without further ado, hopping into the, the state of senior living. Uh, first trend that we want to take a look at here. Um, so it's, it's being reported that 56% of potential clients won't be able to afford the current assisted living rates of $5,000 a month. Um, so with the, the population boom and that, you know, silver tsunami, how, you know, that we're calling it, um, you know, some, uh, some solutions that are being pioneered in two major ways are around operations and design and development. Um, so, you know, something to address this trend is it's really going to require communities to have uh, a different mindset and kind of rethinking some of their traditional ways. Um, because, you know, right now, not only is it too expensive on average, but the, the middle income makes too much to qualify for, for Medicaid and government-sponsored living communities, so they're kind of stuck in that limbo, um, you know, in, in order to get the care that they need. Uh, so, Mark, yep. what are some of the, the things that you're seeing around the middle market and, and what LSS is doing to address that? Well, that's, that's spot on because that middle market is a real challenge for us uh, to find a way to provide those services for the 10 life plan communities we have are serving the upper income market and above, and then we have eight affordable housing that are serving the, the low income. Trying to find that right uh, dynamic to meet that, meet that middle market to build the communities and operate them is very challenging. So certainly looking at various things to do that, but we haven't found a solution yet. Uh, I think we're busy just trying to make things efficient 
in the areas we do serve and then carry over what we learn there in trying to find that right model for that middle market that is not served adequately and won't be for the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and so when we kind of think about, you know, addressing the, the trends in the middle market, that leads us into some other big trends that are affecting all of us, which are Sorry about that. There we go. Um, an increase in resident needs and an increase in staff demand. Uh, so, you know, a, a common story is that, you know, with the the middle popul you know, the middle market coming in, you're going to start seeing more residents. Um, they're going to have those increasing demands, but then at the same time, you're also experiencing the tighter budgets and tighter resources. Um, so resident needs and you know, that increase in resident needs kind of goes in tandem uh, with the increase in staff demand. So when we think about that increase in, in resident needs, um, you know, it can be little things, you know, that are affecting facilities because of, you know, the, the resident aspect around entertainment. So a lot of them have computers and tablets and smart TVs. Um, especially also around communication. Um, so, you know, they're very heavily evolved in email. They want to be able to submit their own maintenance requests. Um, and they're kind of looking for, for that technology to have all in one place. Um, you know, something else that, you know, obviously we're hearing more and more of is that you're getting the, the pressure from the families as well. Um, so kind of these resident needs are, are starting to become more complex as we move further along in, in the digital age. Uh, so, you know, I think one thing that correlates that with the, the staff demand is that um, the, the staff, you know, they have this pressure to still maintain uh, the, the resident satisfaction. Um, they still have to meet those resident needs, um, you know, and because of that demand on them, uh, you, you know, staff are wanting, you know, higher pay um, and they're also wanting the, the best technology to, to help them do their jobs better. Uh, so, Mark, anything to to add there in regard to how these you know the increase in resident demands are affecting your communities um, and it really affecting the way that you do work? Yeah, I, I think all of us are impacted by the staffing challenges that we're having, and as an organization, that's a major initiative for us this year to find the right people and to hold on to them. And technology is something that some of the new staff we're hiring. Uh, we're dealing with. Some come in with high technology expectations that we have it there to give them so they can use, and others are still challenged with it. So that's a challenge for us as we know we need to use more technology. Uh, it's interesting to see that our residents are encouraged to see us use more technology because I think they're beginning to understand that it's important for us to do that. Tech is uh, changing so constantly, both for the residents and for staff both. If we don't keep up with it, we're going to start falling behind our competition, uh, especially when you start looking at the efficiency it does provide to help us operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so I apologize. I just want to go back to that poll for a minute. I forgot to say the results earlier. Um, so just wanted to kind of reiterate uh, to, to the audience. I know you were able to, to see that up on your screen as well. Um, but a, a large majority, um, you know, said that, you know, almost 76% of you, you know, were looking for, for ways to increase, increase staff productivity. Uh, around 13% were looking to improve areas around um, tracking assets. Uh, just about 10%, you know, knowing when to use internal staff versus contractors, and then a, a small percentage of you um, looking for ways to reduce energy. Um, so we'll kind of revisit those stats as we get into talking about some of our, our key operational areas. Um, but before we dive into those, you know, five main points that's going to make up a, a lot of what Mark and I are going to talk about today, um, some of the, the key things that come to mind as far as opportunities to become more efficient. Uh, so, you know, of course, being able to share resources between several communities. You know, if you are in a, a situation, you know, similar to LSS, you have lots of communities in the, the same general area, um, you know, so being able to, to use each other to lean on. 
um, being able to find ways to contract out work um, and potentially you know the idea of off-site departments uh, and you know coming up with ways you know to, to use staff members to the best of their ability so kind of getting into you know figuring out how to use the staff that you've got and, and make them more efficient um, and then, of course, you know, a, a theme that we're going to notice throughout as we talk about, you know, trends and being more efficient is implementing technology and data gathering. I think that last uh, point is important, uh, but that first one on sharing resources, uh, even though we've got several communities in close proximity, we find that to be a challenge sometimes because they are short-staffed, but we do do that. Uh, but the other big thing that's important on that last uh bullet point, that data gathering. Uh, data is extremely important to us, and it's another key initiative that we're doing to try to gather that data to help us make better decisions to see where it may be practical for us to share staff between communities. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's an ongoing challenge to what are some ways we can become more efficient. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, exactly. And I think, you know, the importance of that data gathering, that's what's going to uh, you know, give you the ability to to find the, or give you the leverage rather to to prove that you know the time and the tools to measure efficiency and and finding those ways to increase it to be able to address you know continue to address the market trends and and find those viable solutions. Um, you know, of course, without compromising the the resident satisfaction along the way. All right. So moving right along, um, so getting into uh, five operational areas that you should look at. Uh, so we're going to now kind of dissect some of these efficiency opportunities um, and, and grouping them into the, the five key areas. So those five key areas are going to be around assets, staff and productivity. So that one will be a, a big one, you know, and of course based on uh, poll results, uh, you know, we'll make sure we spend uh, lots of time around that one, uh, and also budgeting work budgeting and work hours, so that kind of goes definitely hand in hand with the the staff and productivity piece, especially when we think about you know leveraging data and getting the data that you need to to prove for for resources um, you know time management, leveraging mobile technology. We're also going to talk a little bit about energy uh, and then of course that staff and contractors piece. So hopping into the first operational area around assets. Uh, so assets is, is definitely a, a big topic within itself here. Um, you know, so a couple of key points is, you know, being able to effectively manage your assets, of course, starts with better tracking and monitoring. Um, so it's kind of, you know, being able to take that first step and, and really get a full picture of, you know, what are all of those capital assets that you have at your community. Um, assets is also one of those things that definitely goes hand in hand uh, with preventative maintenance. Um, you know, so the, the first step is you have to start tracking and monitoring those assets. And if you have a, a software uh, that's going to help you with that tracking um, so that you have better insight into how each of those assets is performing. Um, you know, again, that goes into to preventative maintenance. You're going to be able to to be more proactive in the long run um, instead of always being reactive. Uh, and so, if you're if you're able to get to that proactive point by knowing when to do those PMs on your assets, you're having that work order history build up against those equipment profiles. Um, ultimately, you're gonna you're gonna reduce costs and you're gonna extend the life of those assets. Um, so definitely ties in very much so with, you know, areas of efficiency because uh, the, the goal obviously is to improve, you know, longevity, performance, and, and again, ultimately decreasing, decreasing those costs. Um, so Mark, anything Yeah, yeah. That, that oh, software system is important. Uh, and I think the challenge that uh, we've had as an organization is we're not getting our assets in because uh, we've been so rushed just to get the regular day-to-day -day stuff, we find the software certainly helping us improve efficiency with getting the work orders in, taking care of them, and even some of the preventive maintenance. Uh, I'd say our next goal is to get those assets in so that we can track that and even do a better job of making good decisions. 
Uh, but that's a challenge. I think what we're trying to do is determine what assets do we put in to track, mm-hmm. and then how do we integrate that into our budgeting cycle, which we're starting to work with accounting uh, to make that happen. In the past, we've done it uh, a little bit with just a very detailed and laborious Excel spreadsheet, which has been very hard to keep up. So we're looking forward to be able to get to a day to get those prime assets into our software system uh, so that we can better uh, track them with relationship to the work orders and the PM that's associated with them uh, to better plan for the future, which will also help us manage the resources we do have to stay efficient. Exactly. And you bring up a really good point there, Mark. You know, I think a lot of the communities are are in the same boat there as far as kind of how they've set goals for themselves where, you know, a, a lot of communities, you know, you are really good at, at doing your PMs. You have a really good PM and PM plan in place, um, but then it's kind of setting yourself up for success in the long run where you want to achieve that secondary goal. And that's getting your assets tracked, getting them into your software system, and being able to link the two together um, because that's really what's going to make that process full circle. Um, You know, another thing around, you know, asset management is a lot of times folks think that, you know, your work order history and your capital planning, um, you know, have to be separate or you've maybe you've kept them separate in the past uh, when really, it's going to be more beneficial if you can get that work order history and that capital planning all together uh, in one place uh, because that's what's going to give you those better insights and, and estimates on, you know, when you might have to budget for replacing an air handler or replacing a boiler. Um, so anything to add there around, you know, I know that's an initiative of yours, Mark, on on asset tracking um, you know, but anything in the past to add on how, you know, having some idea of your capital equipment has helped in the, the budgeting process? I think that's the part we're a little weak on. So we just keep putting these big numbers into our capital budget, which we happen to be in the process right now. It would sure be nice, and I know accounting would sure like us to have a little more data on saying, well, why <laughs> do you need that much? And show me some history of where you've actually spent that. Uh, and right mm-hmm. now it's pretty generic. Uh, We're on our third software system, and it seems like we never get to the point of getting our assets in. And so that is a prime initiative for us to determine what we need to get in and get those in so that we can do that better planning and long-term planning for our assets. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly. And I I think definitely assets will will start to come, you know, more to the the forefront of, you know, an area that communities need to focus on, especially um, when we consider, you know, compliance and regulations. So, uh, and one other thing too, before we move on from assets, um, kind of an interesting tidbit uh, that I always like to point out uh, in the asset conversation is, you know, I think one area that's very easily overlooked uh, when it comes to tracking assets and equipment are warranty expirations. Um, so, you know, when when communities are looking for ways to be more efficient and, and be more cost effective, um, being able to track your warranties. Uh, you know, especially for that newer equipment so that that way if something breaks down, you need to do a repair. You know, a, a lot of times communities might be shelling out that money and not realizing that that is something that is under warranty. Um, so, you know, being able to track that information all in one place uh, is something that can be very, very helpful. All right. So moving right along, staff and productivity. So this was the the number one answer uh, for the poll at a, an overwhelming uh, majority here at 76%. Uh, so big conversation here around uh, staff and productivity. Uh, so when we think of staff and productivity, kind of three areas come to mind. So time management, mobile technology, and staff education. Uh, so when it comes to staff and productivity, you know, I think starting with time management, um, you know, that's a good place to look at first um, because in order to save time, first we have to know what it's being spent on. Um, so this is where, you know, being able to gather that information, you know, by leveraging mobile technology to help get you the data um, and the reports that you need around time management and where your staff is spending their time. Um, Because then in turn, uh, time management is is 
going to directly correlate with productivity. Um, so when we think about you know leveraging mobile technology, I have some uh, interesting stats here uh, from our our customer data that we've gathered. Uh, so those that are using mobile technology to track their work orders and log time against those work orders, we've found that on average, um, those who are, are, are tracking time, they're closing out their work orders 48% faster. Uh, and then they also have 45% less overdue work orders. Um, because when we think of being able to track time, always having a finger on you know, what your work orders are, that information you know, being updated in real time, saving time on not having to go back and forth between the maintenance office because you have that information at your fingertips on those mobile devices, um, you know, it, it definitely makes them more efficient uh, and it's going to increase that productivity. Um, so time management, mobile technology, you know, very much go, go hand in hand there. Um, Mark, anything there to, to add in regard to, I know a lot of your communities are, are using mobile technology to, to track their work orders. Um, any productivity and efficiency gains to share? I think it's still in a learning mode for us uh, as we gather the information and get staff to use to its full ability, we'll be able to look at that. I can't exactly uh, confirm or deny the numbers that you just stated for our organization uh, because we haven't tracked it that well. And, and that's been a part of our opportunity with our staff, getting them understanding this is a tool to help them do their job and to provide better services for our residents. It's not a tool to say, are you doing your job? Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes exactly. that mentality gets in there. And as we continue to educate them, and we also have to educate our supervisors to help them educate them as well, to help everybody see that this is a tool to help our residents, and that's what we're here for as an organization. Uh, it is uh, troubling sometimes to provide the tools so our staff can help them do their job better, and they don't use it effectively. So uh, we're getting better as we've come through this. I think I can say when we first started tracking this, they were probably only putting in about 40% of their week as far as hours. Our goal is to get up between 70 to 75%, and we're getting close mm -hmm. to that. So we are progressing. So that's a good thing. And staff are beginning to see, whoo, this does make this better. Uh, so it's a good thing for us. Do I have the data to say we've increased this much? Uh, I really don't, uh, but we have this feeling, this gut feeling that, yes, it is helping us. And if nothing else, our resident satisfaction is being maintained, uh, and we haven't lost any staff by implementing the mobile technology, even with some of our old-timers that are a little reluctant uh, to start using it at first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's an important thing to, to realize is, you know, there is always going to be that learning curve when you, you know, introduce new technology. Um, and that's a, a really great story to hear, you know, even with, you know, some of the, the older staff being able to, you know, successfully adopt that mobile technology, um, you know, and the fact that through your reporting that you've been keeping an eye on, um, you know, you kind of knew where you started and, and you've started to see an increase in those productivity and efficiency gains and, and really just more data that's been gathered, um, you know, as far as where the, the time is going um, for the, the facility staff. Um, yeah. And also you brought up a good point, you know, around, you know, staff education. Uh, you know, I think staff education d directly correlates with productivity as we want to make sure that staff have the, the resources and the information they need, um, you know, to be effective in their jobs. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out, you know, kind of tying in a, a little bit to housekeeping is, you know, kind of on average, you know, a, cleaning a room can take anywhere between, you know, 15 to, to 75 minutes, depending on the size of the room. Uh, so, you know, anything that you can do to keep the average down without sacrificing, of course, the cleanliness or standard of living, you know, then ultimately your, your productivity is going to increase. Um, so, you know, one way to, to increase that housekeeping productivity is to hold those continuous training sessions for them and, and educating them on ways to improve. Um, you know, and I think the same thing can be said on the maintenance side is, you know, leveraging your staff, leveraging their skill sets. 
um, and, and being able to, you know, if you have someone who's highly skilled at being an electrician, you know, making sure that that's where their time is being spent um, and maybe they can even, you know, pass along some of that knowledge to to other uh, staff members. Um, yeah. Another, Oops, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I was going to say I agree with that, uh, that we've been able to use this tool to help train and see where some weak points are uh, with some of our staff. Um, and just a little bit more on how to increase their productivity with some of the metrics we're getting. Uh, each site does a little bit of different differently, but one of the sites, they post each guy's weekly time hours and kind of do a little, use a little bit of peer pressure to kind of encourage, see, other guys are getting this many hours in, why can't you to bring everybody up? Uh, and we've seen yes, more absolutely. of that happening than that one offer trying to bring everybody else down uh, to kind of show, hey, this is not so bad. This will help us all do our jobs better and help one another as a team. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So creating a, a little bit of friendly competition there. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and then just, you know, one last thing to, to add around, you know, the, the staff education piece, you know, directly correlating with productivity um, as well as the preventative maintenance piece. So it's, you know, interesting really, you know, how all of these key operation areas really uniquely tie in uh, with each other. Um, but on, you know, the, the staff management piece or staff education piece, I apologize, is, you know, making sure that we're keeping in mind that you want to think about the, the techs that you're going to be hiring several years from now, uh, not necessarily just focusing on, you know, the, the skilled techs that you have today. Um, so when it comes to, you know, taking your preventative maintenance to the next level, making sure that as you do build out your PM plan in your software system is that you're, you're being very robust with the tasks and procedures um, because that's really going to help with that staff education piece. So even though, you know, your team that you have now you know, they might be able to go through and do those PMs with their eyes closed. Um, but, you know, as as you have new residents come in, you have older staff that retire, um, you know, retaining all of, you know, what's inside our facility director's brains now, what's inside your technician's brains, you know, that's something that's also going to become very, very important um, around the, the staff and productivity area. I can't agree with you more that staff education and documenting it is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, as we continue to transition staff. Otherwise, we like to refer to it as viral training where one person trains somebody else, but it <clears throat> may not be right, and it kind of mutates sometimes, and it doesn't get the job done correctly or even efficiently sometimes. So that documentation is extremely important to help educate staff in the future. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. All right, so moving on to the next slide here, um, budgeting and work orders or work hours. So these definitely go, you know, very much hand in hand with the, the staff and productivity slide. Um, you know, so because when you, you start incorporating that time management, you start incorporating that mobile technology, um, you know, then we kind of talk about, you know, some of those data-driven uh, reporting and, and your budget-related KPIs that you can start to take a look at um, because if you're tracking the work hours, you know, you know where your time is being spent. You know, so how much time are you spending on electrical work orders? How much time are you spending on HVAC work orders? Uh, all of that data is going to start to to help you prove, um, you know, if, if you need more staff on hand. Um, you know, it's yeah, exactly. So it's going to give you that upper hand in the the boardroom to to get you the resources that you need. Um, so you know, we want to start taking into consideration things like response time um, and work hours and average days open and and average days overdue. Um, that's all going to help tie into you know making sure that you can properly budget for the resources that you need. One thing we're starting to see, uh, having multiple communities to compare data with one another, uh, starting to look at some of those metrics, the amount of time per work order, the number of work orders per square foot of a community to try to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, uh, where time is spent by the, each category. That's one of the things that's been interesting for us because some of our maintenance guys who are very skilled at doing electrical plumbing or HVAC were spending too much time in setup and takedowns for special events 
uh, for various mm-hmm. activities that may not have been planned well. So getting that data and being able to compare it to one another is very important. One thing I, I have found also useful is we keep getting asked, well, how does this compare to other people? Now we're able to compare to one another, but not only to one another, uh, we have now the ability to share our data and see data from other senior living communities to say, well, what are other people doing to help us say uh, we do need additional staff? This is what we're seeing uh, to maintain resident satisfaction, and this is what other people are doing because we're finding more and more people want the data to be able to make good decisions, not just emotional decisions are always driven by the budget, uh, but data to support to show how we can improve efficiency and keep resident satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So definitely being able to to benchmark yourselves, you know, not only against each other uh, to see where you, you know, where all of your communities compare, um, but having those benchmarks, you know, across other senior living communities, um, you know, using the same platform. Great. All right. So moving into talk a little bit about energy. Um, so I know this is kind of uh, one of the, the outliers it may seem like as we're talking about, you know, kind of five key areas of, of operational efficiencies. But, you know, I definitely think it's one that we, we want to make sure we don't overlook it um, because energy is the, the second highest line item in your budget behind staff and compensation. Um, so that's, a, you know, definitely a, a huge cost area, uh, you know, that we want to make sure we're being cognizant of. Um, and I think a, a big misconception is that energy is a fixed cost uh, when really, you know, there are, are ways that, that you can change that um, and, and there's ways where you can definitely be more cost effective uh, when it comes to energy. Um, so one thing I just want to talk a, a little bit about around energy here is, is at Dude Solutions, we've created the, the five C's of conservation. Uh, and so these five C's of conservation um, are really things to, to help you know what you can do to try and lower that energy bill. Um, so those five C's are clarity, culture, compliance, cost avoidance, and communication. Um, so just to kind of tell you a, a little bit about each one of those C's. Um, so when we think about clarity, this is where you're, you know, you want to make sure you're getting full visibility into your utility bills, um, the utility meters, um, and getting that full usage picture. So, you know, by having clarity into that information, you're going to know what you're spending and where you're spending. Um, so really, you know, being able to to use a software to help um, map out your energy expenses. So then when we move into to culture, you know, this is kind of the idea of creating a, a conservation army. Um, so, you know, it's made up of peers and stakeholders where you're, you're making them energy stewards um, a, across the organization, and, and these are the people who can implement those energy-saving programs and campaigns, um, or, you know, we like to call a, implementing a green team. Um, so it's kind of the idea of, of creating that culture of, of energy conservation because uh, in the long run, you know, ultimately that's going to benefit you. Uh, there's also the compliance component. Uh, so ensuring, you know, that you, you have the right data and reports uh, for regulatory compliance. Um, so, you know, knowing what you need uh, to be monitoring um, and, of course, you know, being able to, to use reporting to show your progress um, and prove that you are in compliance. And then there's also the idea of um, cost avoidance. Uh, so, you know, being able to, to measure and validate any of your savings or, um, you know, how well you're doing uh, with some of the, the performance of your energy conservation efforts. Um, so, of course, when we think about cost avoidance, you know, being able to uh, establish a baseline year and, and normalize for, for different variables like the, the weather and occupancy. Um, but, you know, I think cost avoidance is something that you can use to help vouch for, you know, implementing projects like, you know, retrofitting lights, you know, HVAC enhancements, um, you know, anything that's going to give you that, that cost avoidance. And then, of course, lastly, uh, a little bit, a bit on communication. 
so being able to to gain the buy-in and and be transparent around your energy efforts. Um, so you know, being able to to establish a regular cadence. Uh, with the necessary stakeholders, and being able to document your standard operating procedures. So I think, you know, a, a combination of applying all five of those C's of cons conservation um, is really going to help you guys be more efficient in, in the energy area. Um, so I know, you know, Mark, with you being in, um, you know, construction and development for LSS, uh, you know, I'll let you talk a little bit about energy efficiency and, and kind of how you view, um, you know, that, that one of those, that key operational area. In the Midwest, we've been very fortunate to have lower utility rates, so it hasn't always been a major priority for us. New building codes are requiring us to up the ante a little bit related to that. Uh, although we did do a uh, <laughs> survey once with our residents and say, okay, are you willing to spend, oh, I think it might have been 10% more to have higher efficiency buildings, almost to getting them green or LEED certified? And it pretty well came back with a resounding no. Uh, so we haven't really put a lot of effort. That being said, we do look at our cost per square foot of all of our communities for the utilities. And what we have done is those outliers, we have focused on those specific communities to say, why is this one so high? Is it the way it's been built? Are the utility rates wrong? Are we wasting something somewhere? So we kind of set that as our high priority. We have done some solar panel projects, but those are usually grants because uh, the ROI just has not been there. Uh, but we are finding when we put those solar panels in, we are dealing with compliance because now the local government wants to know, well, how much is being produced because they want to kind of raise the flag and tell people we're – using solar panels, and this is how much is being produced in our particular communi community. But I'd have to agree with everybody else. It's not a high priority for us, but we do understand to look at every nickel and dime that we can for the future, especially as we try to support the middle market. Uh, we've got to look mm -hmm. at this area as well to keep it as low as possible. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. All right, so moving into our last uh, key area here uh, around, you know, the, the, con the idea of, you know, when is it going to be more beneficial for you to use internal staff versus hiring out a contractor? Um, so another conversation here around, you know, focusing on those KPIs. Um, so looking at things like, you know, your volume of work, billings per resident unit, percentage of work completed on time, and average days overdue. Um, you know, so again here, going back to that common theme of, you know, using technology as a turning point um, in order to make those decisions, you need to you need to be able to to gather the data um, because if if you can if you can gather the data um, that's going to give you uh, the ability to make um, you know data driven decisions and actually have actionable analytics there. Um, so kind of a, a couple of fun stories uh, that I have around here. So uh, I was working with one community, and um, you know over the course of a, a couple of years because they were accurately tracking uh, the categories on their work orders, so knowing what type of work was being done, um, and also the time tracking component on their work orders. For t about two years, they were contracting out all of their HVAC work. Um, and from being able to, to gather the data over the course of those two years, they were able to prove and justify um, that they could hire one full-time HVAC technician and one other regular technician. Um, so I thought that was a really powerful story as far as how, you know, gathering that data, um, you know, really ties back to being able to make those decisions on, you know, really looking into all the work that you contract out um, and, you know, if you're being the, the most cost effective in that area. Uh, another story kind of along the same line, um, but uh, another community, they were able to hire, they were able to hire an electrician. Um, so by hiring a, a full-time electrician, um, they were able to, to leverage his skill set um, to, to train other technicians on some of the more simpler electric, electrical jobs so that he could focus on the, the larger um, electrical issues that were going on. 
Uh, so some really powerful stories there on, you know, being able to, to translate your, your work data, um, you know, into those data-driven decisions. Uh, so Mark, any stories to share there where, you know, you may have decided to contract work out instead of using internal staff or vice versa? I think the story in the HVAC came from one of our communities because that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> once they got the, da the data, uh, they have trained staff and now are doing much more of that HVAC in-house. The other thing on this particular uh, uh, slide, the billings per resident unit, uh, we're kind of looking at that at another way, is that uh, using our software system, we're starting to be able to track those billable hours that are uh, resident requests that are out of the ordinary where we can bill back to them, which we've been very lax at that. Uh, so we're able to do that a lot easier now and not make it a total revenue generator, uh, but at least to have a residents think before they ask, knowing that if they ask too much, something else is not going to get done and their, their uh, monthly service fee may go up because we need more staff to take care of them. Uh, so we are starting to build back more and more at each one of our communities for those special resident things like hanging pictures, moving furniture, uh, putting up a special chandelier or a special plumbing device, things like that, which we don't normally do automatically. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, definitely kind of some, some area of opportunity there um, when it comes to, to billing residents for kind of some of those above and beyond tasks uh, that you guys are doing. And, and that, of course, you know, ties back to the, the trend of the, the increase in resident demands as well. So being able to, to handle those situations. So. All right. Um, so last but not least, uh, we just want to take a, a couple of more minutes and um, Mark's going to talk a, a little bit about uh, some of the, the key takeaways. You know, so we definitely hope that you've picked up on some tips and tricks uh, that you can take back and uh, apply at your communities for, you know, improvements in, in operational efficiency. Um, you know, I think, again, we can all agree on that leveraging technology and, and working smarter, not harder, as they say, uh, are, you know, some of the, the biggest themes, um, you know, when talking about a conversation like this. Uh, so moving on to the next slide here. Um, so, you know, Mark, I know one of the things that we, you know, talked uh, about ahead of this topic is, you know, some things that you can share around, you know, how are you guys at LSS balancing resident satisfaction with getting the job done? That's always a challenge. Uh, at LSS, that resident satisfaction and customer service is paramount, as I'm sure it is for many of the others listening today. Uh, but our model as part of a life plan community is about relationships, not only between residents, but also between residents and staff. So we often got to give some grace to our staff when it may take a little longer to get some jobs done. Uh, but with the technology that we now have, uh, I think that may allow some of that to happen. And I think with the technology in their hand as they're talking to the resident, sometimes the resident knows that, hey, they need to get on to the next job. Uh, so it's a kind of a combination of technology helping to still maintain something that's real important about in our communities, and that's relationships. Uh, that has really been good for us. I, I think we're starting to use that. I think the, the staff timers with our, re with our staff, they're beginning to see what it really takes to do a job, and that has helped us, of course, plan a lot better. And as I think I shared earlier, I think the residents see that, and they understand we're also looking at ways to be as efficient and pos as possible for us. Uh, has it been a challenge to go to mobile versus what we used to have, which was all paper with our last two systems we had? Uh, I'd say yes. Uh, it's just getting people used to using that device on a regular basis. We've been up and running for a year now, and I think we're still learning as well as staff is still learning how to use it effectively and to trust it and trust us that this is a good thing for our residents. And I think that's the key point in this whole discussion is we're using mobile technology to help us provide better service to our residents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd be interested Absolutely. about any questions uh, from the people. Great. Yeah, so with, with that, Lois, if there's any questions that have come in, uh, we can go ahead and, and move to uh, the, the QA portion. Sure, absolutely. Um, 
Thank you both for all the information you've provided so far. I'll just remind everybody that if you have a question, you can type it in the Ask a Question box below the slides and then click on the red Submit button, and we'll get to as many as we can. So our first question is, as a maintenance director, I am being challenged to gather data regarding our maintenance efforts, but we've never done it before, and it's hard to run the department and collect data. How did you manage to do both? Oh, boy, that's an excellent question. It's a challenge. Uh, fortunately, at our, or our organization as a system, we have resources at the home office to help do that. So as we rolled out each community, there was a representative from the home office to help them do their job to do that. Uh, as I think about maybe a standalone community, what I would really uh, encourage is to spend the time to maybe hire a consultant to help it get set up and done right. Because I agree, it's very hard for you to run your day-to-day -day job and get together a good PM pro software PM mobile platform, implement it, and moving forward. So for a standalone community, try to get the extra money to have a consultant work with your team and whoever your software provider is to get it implemented correctly. Because if you don't, uh, it won't get used correctly. Uh, to get the documentation and how you set it up, what to do when you have new employees to have that documented training so you're not doing that viral training, as I refer to, uh, for that new employees that you get hired. So I'd really encourage you to maybe find a consultant to help you walk through this process to make sure it gets done correctly. Another Hopefully that answers there. there. Oh. Go ahead. I was going to say we have another question for you about the technology platform you're using, if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so if you're referring to the mobile uh, platform, we looked at both iPad and uh, the Android platform, and we sent it around iPad, and that was really probably more geared to our IT people uh, felt they could, believe it or not, secure the iPad better, and I, and I don't know how they're actually doing that, uh, but we pretty well control what they can uh, put on their iPad. So they can't use it to play games and all that other kind of stuff. It's pretty well locked down by our IT folks. IT folks push down updates, um, and if it, something has to be done at the iPad itself to initiate that update, they send out kind of a tech bulletin, all our people, uh, to try to keep people up on the same platform. So, yeah, we're using the iPads for the mobile technology, uh, but it's standard uh, PC stuff on the back end for people sitting at their desktops. Okay, great. And everyone, while we're asking uh, questions, if you'd like to answer the poll question that appears on your screen right now, that would be great. Um, we'll share the results with that as well. Um, okay, and our next question uh, for Mark. Um, have um, Are there published benchmarks for those who don't have sister facilities? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't know if they're published. Well, there are. If you're a member of the... Uh or have access to uh, IFMA, International Facility Management Association. They have some, but the hard thing that I've always found is to find one related to strictly senior living. Uh, and that's, uh, I have to say, that's the nice thing about the software we are using. We can see data from other organizations like ours and compare it to it. Uh, that's been very valuable for us as we start planning and even start educating management to say, this is where a lot of our peers are, this is where we are. Mm -hmm. And I, I can add a, a little bit to that, um, you know, kind of around some of those KPIs. Um, I actually uh, pulled some of the numbers um, from our, our platform, which we look at senior living communities specifically. Um, so just kind of going back to some of the KPIs that were on an earlier slide. Um, so when we think about looking at volume of work, which is the number of work orders per resident unit, um, and, and these are all benchmarks based on the last year of data, so it's an annual benchmark. Um, it's around 20 work orders uh, per resident unit. Um, billings per resident unit is about $25 annually. Percent of work completed on time is 77%. And average days overdue is at 3.9 days. Um, so those are some, uh, some key KPI um, benchmarks uh, that we uh, consistently pull data for. 
Another question for Mark. Uh, what is the average energy cost per square foot for your communities, if you would not? <laughs> That's a good question. And you got to uh, be, uh, let me share. This is what we look at. So we look at the water, sewer, gas, um, electric, what am I missing? Water, sewer, gas, electric, water. Uh, yeah, every, that's everything. And so it ranges for our communities. And we're in the Midwest uh, again, and probably between a buck and a quarter to a buck fifty per square foot. Uh, so most of our communities are pretty good size. Uh, we manage close to five million square feet of uh, buildings, and that can be from a single household to a large multi story building of various different building models. So it's a range, and we're continuing to refine that. Uh, but we have hundreds of utility bills that we have to gather and put that together. So we don't do that on a regular basis. Uh, that's a, another project I really would like to work on to make sure we're current with that to monitor our energy usage. All right, great. And uh, what has been your biggest challenge in having your staff use your mobile tool? for work order tracking, and what has been your greatest success since changing over from your paper-based process? I think the biggest uh, opportunity is uh, getting them to trust the device, uh, that the timer that they're using in there, that the data that's there is accurate. So uh, generally how we get them to operate, and again, we're trying to do this as a system, is they start off the day in the shop, uh, they access the wireless uh, network in the shop, download all the information uh, that's been assigned to them for the day, and we assign work orders in various methods, and, and actually we allow them to select work orders. Uh, so if, if anything, we don't have as much of concern about scheduling or one person scheduling everything. We're starting to trust them to self-schedule, uh, and we look very carefully at people cherry-picking work orders to the easy stuff, but we try to say this is about efficiency. So if you see stuff in an area, you take everything in that area. So they can get all those work orders on their tablet, go to that area, do the work, start their timers, uh, get everything done, and hopefully they'll have the parts real close. They don't have to run back to the shop. And then when they run out of work orders, uh, go to a Wi-Fi hotspot and sync back up again uh, to update the data that they have and then uh, get new stuff to download. And so they really don't have to come back to the shop. I'd say, if anything, that's our big challenge that to, get to, to do that, uh, to get them used to doing that process, to not the way they used to do it, take a couple pieces of paper, get them done, walk all the way back to the shop, new pieces of paper, probably shoot the bull with some other guys, and then head back to work. So we're gaining a lot of efficiencies. And so if anything else, I would say that has been the biggest takeaway in starting to use a mobile platform uh, for doing that. Um, did you want to mention which software you use? That was a follow-up question to the uh, one about the technology platform. Is that Apple or Microsoft you want me to refer to? So we use Apple tablets and Microsoft in the back end, but uh, we're using the WorkSub. Uh, the past software platforms we have used, and this is an interesting, very old DOS program called Oops, Ounce of Prevention, and then uh, the last one we just changed over about a year and a half from that one was Micromain. So we switched from Micromain uh, that did have a mobile platform, but it was very cumbersome uh, to what we're using now, the WorkSub. One final question before we wrap it up here. Um, do you see an upgrade in your nurse call system as a viable option in skilled nursing uh, part of the CCRC um, to aid in nurse productivity and resident satisfaction by having features such as audio into the room and call response in my room? Well, that's a, a conversation that we could probably take two hours on in and of itself. Uh, but we have we have gone to a platform that at least starts collecting data as far as by the time a resident pulls the cord and it's responded to so that we can start tracking how much time that it does take to take care of those pull cord things. Uh, we have not used the uh, voice features of some of these applications. We think we feel that's very disruptive. We still try to 
to keep more of a home-like atmosphere. And we think carrying around loud, loud walkie-talkies or someone being on a cell phone or with a headset on is not very uh, person-centered care. Uh, so we try to balance the technology with trying to be person-centered care. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to answer those questions. Um, so to the attendees, I'd like to say we hope you've enjoyed today's webcast. Remember, this session will be available shortly to listen to online again. So if you'd like to listen to it again or you think a colleague would benefit from this information, uh, please write down this web address, mcknightsseniorliving.com slash July 25 webinar. We'd like to give special thanks to Mark and Rachel for taking time with us today to frame this important issue in an understandable way. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Dude Solutions, provider of the Works Hub. You can visit dudesolutions.com to learn more about the company. Please note that all attendees will be redirected to a post-webinar survey after this presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that survey. Thanks, everyone, for listening today. Your questions were outstanding, and I'm sure helped fellow listeners gain an even better understanding of this topic. Once again, thanks for tuning in. This is Lois Bowers for McKnight Senior Living.